In 1991, a documentary was aired that disturbed and shocked viewers. It followed a six-year-old girl, Beth Thompson, as she converses with clinical psychologist Dr. Ken Magid, candidly explaining to him that her parents lock her door at night to prevent her from harming them and her younger brother, John. She casually confirms their fears are real because she wants to stab them. Beth readily admits to acts such as sticking pins in her brother as she wants him to die. She also states she wants to stick pins in her parents, Tim and Julie, for the same reason. Beth also discusses molesting her younger brother, pinching and kicking his privates. Her mother Julie recalls times in which she caught her touching John and Beth confirmed to Julie she had digitally violated his rectum. Beth also describes excessive self-touching behaviours. Doing this daily and in public, as well as this, she talks about harming animals, sticking pins in the family cats and dog, as well as an incident wherein Beth squeezed a nest of baby birds to death. What had happened to Beth for her to be exhibiting such extreme and aggressive behaviours? Beth and her younger brother John were not Pastor Tim and Julie's biological children, instead adopting the pair when Beth was 18 months old and their life before the couple was far from safe or happy. Little is known about their birth parents. Their mother passed away from a kidney disease when Beth was only one years old, leaving the partner as the sole carer, and the state the children were found in indicates exactly how they were treated. John was found in a bassinet, wet from urine with bottles of sour milk at his feet. The bottom of his head was completely flat from being left lying in the same position day after day. Many years later, a 32-year-old Beth would talk about having six older siblings in an interview, but nothing is known about them. Beth herself suffered much neglect and mistreatment from her father, physical and adult. Back in her 1991 session with Dr. McGid, she talks about him hitting on her, beating her basically, and coming into her room at night and touching her until she bled, from around the time she was one years old. All of this trauma culminated in the behaviours detailed earlier in the video. It would be in the months after her adoption by Tim and Julie that these behaviours would escalate in frequency and severity. After seeking help from psychological experts, it was determined that Beth had RAD, Reactive Detachment Disorder. RAD is categorised in the DSM-5 under trauma and stressor-related disorders. The diagnostic criteria is as follows. A. A consistent pattern of inhibited, emotionally withdrawn behaviour towards adult caregivers manifested by both of the following. The child rarely or minimally seeks comfort when distressed. The child rarely or minimally responds to comfort when distressed. B. A consistent social or emotional disturbance characterised by at least two of the following. Minimal social and emotional responsiveness to others. Limited positive effect. Episodes of unexplained irritability, sadness or fearfulness that are evident even during non-threatening interactions with adult caregivers. C. The child has experienced a pattern of extremes of insufficient care as evidenced by at least one of the following. Social neglect or deprivation in the form of persistent lack of having basic emotional needs for comfort, stimulation and affection met by caring adults. Repeated changes of primary caregivers that limit opportunities to form stable attachments, e.g. frequent changes in foster care. Rearing in unusual settings that severely limit opportunities to form selective attachments, e.g. institutions with high child-to-caregiver ratios. D. The care in Criterion C is presumed to be responsible for the disturbed behaviour in Criterion A, e.g. the disturbances in Criterion A began following the lack of adequate care in Criterion C. E. The criteria are not met for Autistic Spectrum Disorder. F. The disturbance is evident before age 5 years. G. The child has a developmental age of at least 9 months. Specify if persistent. The disorder has been present for more than 12 months. Specify current severity. Reactive attachment disorder is specified as severe when a child exhibits all symptoms of the disorder, with each symptom manifesting at relatively high levels. Upon hearing about the case of Beth Thomas, many people would jump to assume that the child was suffering with psychopathy or sociopathy. It's important to note that neither of these terms are actually diagnosable mental health conditions or disorders. Sociopathy, or the state of being a sociopath, 
is more linked to antisocial personality disorder and is a term that is thrown around so much that people can't distinguish between being a sociopath and antisocial personality disorder, often conflating the two together and stigmatizing antisocial personality disorder without understanding what it is, what causes it, and the treatments for it. And this stigmatization is what would lead many everyday people upon hearing about the shocking and disturbing elements of Beth's behavior to label her a sociopath or somebody with antisocial personality disorder. But she does not have antisocial personality disorder. She doesn't even have a personality disorder. She has an attachment disorder. I will go over the basic principle of attachment right here. Bowlby argues that attachments are formed from birth. Your attachment towards your primary caregiver and the state of it will determine how stable you are mentally and therefore how you interact with the rest of the world. Hazan and Schaefer took this a step further, suggesting that relationships had with primary caregivers will later inform people of how they interact in romantic relationships. For example, if you have a stable and healthy relationship with your primary caregiver, your romantic relationships in future life will tend to be, again, stable and healthy. This is known as a secure attachment. It signifies that there was a warm and loving bond between parent and child, and therefore in future relationships they will have no worries with building long-term relationships and will have no fear of abandonment or rejection, generally. The avoidant attachment symbolises that children in their youth have learnt to accept that their emotional needs are unlikely to remain unmet and they will grow up with feelings of being insignificant or unloved and they may in future attend to avoid intimate relationships. The anxious and ambivalent attachment type are from children who are more likely to show distrust and insecurity in adulthood, possibly from having an unstable relationship with their primary caregiver or experiencing abandonment, perhaps through being rehomed through foster care systems, for example. They tend to be very emotionally dependent on others in adulthood. And then there is disorganised attachment, which is a combination of the avoidant and anxious attachment. The children in this group often display intense anger and rage, possibly due to maltreatment in their youth. Adults who have this attachment style tend to avoid intimate relationships and can also have a really hard time controlling their emotions. All attachments of all kinds are on spectrums and they become disorders when it interferes with the person having a functional and healthy lifestyle. So what of Beth? Beth did go on to receive numerous intensive treatments, including under Connell Watkins. Connell Watkins was a controversial attachment therapist practitioner. They are known for the case of Candice Newman. Candice was born in Lincolnton, North Carolina, but was later put up for adoption, being adopted by Jean Elizabeth Newmaker, a single woman and a paediatric nurse practitioner. Within months of the adoption, Jean began to take Candice to a psychiatrist complaining about her attitude and behaviours at home. In the next two years, it got even worse. Supposedly, Candice began to play with matches and kill goldfish. And so Jean took her to Connell Watkins for an intensive session of attachment therapy. Unfortunately, Candice would not survive the second week of the sessions. For the second week of sessions, they decided to perform a rebirthing session, wrapping her up in a flannel sheet covered with pillows to simulate a womb or a birth canal and was instructed to fight her way out of it with the expectation that the experience would somehow help her attach to her adopted mother. Four out of five adults who weighed a combined total of 673 pounds used their hands and feet to push on Candice's head, chest and 70 pound body to resist her attempts to free herself while she complained, pleaded and even screamed for help and air. She stated 11 times during the session that she thought she was dying. In response to this, one of the psychotherapists, Julie Ponder, responded, Go ahead, die right now, for real, for real. 20 minutes into the session, Candice vomited and excreted inside of the sheet, but she was kept restrained within it. 40 minutes into the session, Candice was asked if she wanted to be reborn, and she faintly responded, No. To this... 
Judy Ponder replied, quitter, 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 quit, 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 quit. She's a quitter. Soon after, Watkins asked if she and Ponder could be left in the room with Candice alone. After talking for five minutes, the two decided to unwrap her and found that she was motionless, blue on the fingertips and lips, and were not breathing. Watkins declared, oh, there she is. She's sleeping in her vomit. Whereas Jean, who had been watching on a monitor in the other room, rushed in, remarked about Candice's colour and began CPR while Watkins called 911. The paramedics would arrive 10 minutes later and Candice had been left unconscious and possibly not breathing for some time. The paramedics were able to restore Candice's pulse and she was flown by helicopter to a hospital in Denver, but she was declared brain dead the next day as a consequence of asphyxia. A year later, both Watkins and Ponder were tried and convicted of reckless child mistreatment resulting in death and received 16-year prison sentences. The two therapeutic foster parents who were also present during the session, Brita St. Clair and Jack McDaniel, pleaded guilty to criminally negligent child mistreatment and were given 10 years probation and a thousand hours of community service for a plea bargain. Jean, Candice's adoptive mother, pled guilty to neglect and mistreatment charges and was given a four-year suspended sentence, after which the charges were expunged from her record. Candice Elizabeth Newmaker, born Candice Tiara Elmore, November 19th, 1989 to April 18th, 2000, age 10. I wish I could tell you more about Candice and her hobbies and what she was like as a person, but her life was just filled with so much turmoil. As I mentioned previously, she was adopted, but prior to that, she and her younger brother Michael and younger sister Chelsea were removed from their birth parents for neglect and separated by social services. Around the age of seven, she would be adopted by Jean, and then by the time she was 10 years old, she would be gone. So I am really sorry for her loved ones, for her brother and her sister and anyone else that knew her, any friends that she might have had. I'm so sorry for your loss. It's such a tragic story because her upbringing was so neglectful and so dysfunctional. And when she finally had a safe place to be, she didn't even get to stay there for long and the end of her life wasn't peaceful in the slightest. She must have been terrified. There isn't really a silver lining to this entire case, only that nothing else can hurt Candice now, and I'm so sorry for that. Going back to Beth, I don't think I can 100% credit Watkins for Beth's treatment, because I know at some point she was moved to a home for troubled children, where they specialised with children from troubled and dysfunctional backgrounds, and she was given a lot of boundaries in that home that helped her respect the adults in that area, whereas she hadn't done so before. She did testify on Watkins' behalf in the trial, but apart from that, I think her story with Watkins ends, no matter what her involvement was with Beth's treatment. She was showing great progress. She was displaying remorse for her actions towards her brother and her parents. Unfortunately, she would not stay with that family. She would later be adopted by Nancy Thomas, who was a leading proponent of attachment therapy, even though controversy for that. At least in Beth's case, something did work for her and she didn't have to go through what Candice went through. I do find it sad that I believe her brother John did remain with Tim and Judy so she was in a sense separated from him. It may well have been a positive outcome for both children but again it was another disruption in Beth's life. She had been taken away from her father and placed with adoptive parents only to be sent to a children's home and then be adopted by someone else. I guess the end result was positive, but it does make me question that couple. They did put the time, effort and money into treating Beth just to turn her away at the end. That's really sad for her. She was six at the time of this process truly kicking off and she was just sent away again at the end. However, she has since graduated from the University of Colorado with a bachelor's degree in nursing and she's become an award-winning Flagstaff Medical Center registered nurse. Some people have questioned the legitimacy of Beth's recovery, stating that they think she's better at hiding her true intentions and just decreasing the frequency of her behaviors. 
She's an award-winning nurse. Clearly something at work is going right. And I don't think I have any right to comment on the legitimacy of her treatment. Although psychotherapy is controversial and known as a pseudoscience, something clicked for Beth. And I'm not going to take that away from her. I'm glad that she is living a normal and happy life. I just wanted to talk about this case because it was super interesting to me with so many different facets when talking about attachment disorders and child development, as well as the treatment and the happy end goal as it seems. Beth hurt a lot of people, but she knows that she hurt a lot of people and she clearly feels a lot of remorse for what she did. And right now she's thriving and I'm really happy for her. If you guys like this video, put a comment down in the description, like and subscribe. And I will see you again for another video soon. Bye.